Goedenavond, uh, welkom to another episode of uh, Stream of Consciousness. I am Adam van Sale, or Conscious Caracal, and joining me here tonight is Heinrich Weingart. Uh, he is going to be talking to us about specifically Cape Forum and what Cape Forum is about. I know a lot of my listeners and the people that watch my show are very curious about specifically the Cape and what the, its future holds. So um, uh, Heinrich's position is executive chairperson of Cape Forum, and he's going to be telling us about what his organization and his team are doing to get growing autonomy for the Cape and its communities. Welcome on the show, Heinrich. And thank you very much for the opportunity. It's 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 long overdue, but I'm happy that we were able to uh, um, to realize it this evening. Mm. All right. So, Heinrich, when someone, whether they be a South African or from the uh, from outside, asks you, so you're part of this organization. They just see the name Cape Forum, but they don't know at all what it what it is about. But it, let's say you can give them a small, almost like elevator pitch, basic idea. What do you do? What's your organization trying to achieve? but you don't have a lot of time. How would you explain it to them? Thanks, Erens. I, I guess um, I would start by telling whoever is in that elevator that we are a sister organization of Afri Forum, assuming that the person asking would know about Afri Forum. If they mm. don't, I would tell them that we have two goals. One is the devolution of power to the province. In other words, where government is failing, mm -hmm. we are asking, we are mobilizing politicians, communities, so that we can get those powers devolved down to the province or metro municipalities or local municipalities. And secondly, we want to make a change in the, call it indigenous or colored communities who are mm -hmm. the majority in the Western Cape. Mm. Well, there's a there's a funny point that I think uh, it has been uh, something that's often discussed when it comes to the realities of South Africa. But um, often when Americans hear the the term "colored," they have no idea what it is. They think you're being offensive, or you're you're using like a a slur term for a group. But uh, yeah. you, as a, a colored individual. How would you explain that? I mean, uh, Trevor Noah has made a lot of jokes about it. It's been something that is quite difficult to explain, but how would you explain it in simple terms to someone, that demographic group specifically? So let's start with Trevor Noah. Trevor is mixed race. His father was Swedish, if I have it correctly, and his mother, African, Black South African. Colored people are predominantly descendants of the indigenous communities, the Khoi and the Sun, who lived here many, many, many years before the British and Dutch colonialists and Portuguese set foot um, in Africa, in South, what is now known as South Africa. Um, so, so that's the basic distinction between um, what is called mixed race people and colored people. Now, I am very aware of the complexity of, of these terms in the United States. But remember also that the U.S. came through many, many years, many generations of people debating. Um, so from the what is now just called the N-word um, to being called colored, yes. And um, now African-American seems to be the most acceptable term. Um, in South Africa, we are we're very clear that when we talk about colors, we talk about the descendants of the indigenous communities and the slaves and people, yes, who are mixed race, but who self-identify as colored people. Mm. Our 2011 uh, um, census showed that there are roughly 5 million South Africans. It may sound like a small number, but it is the second largest uh, population group in the country who self-identified as colored. Right. Yeah, Heinrich, you touched on something interesting there, and that's ca caught, uh, captured within just one group's description that you gave there. It just shows the complexity in South Africa that you have between different cultures, different groups, uh, different languages, different religions. Uh, there's this uh, the saying in political science that when you study countries, uh, Brazil is not for beginners. But I think when you try to uh, want to start to understand a community in South Africa, the colored community would also definitely not be for beginners. Um, there's a lot of complexity there. There's a lot of paradoxes as well. English, Afrikaans, Islam, Christian. 
uh, urban, rural. There's so many different aspects to it. But at the same time, this is a community that your organization has identified as one of the communities in need that are not don't have a voice in, in South Africa, that are being sidelined and marginalized. And uh, you see a uh, you see a community that needs an organization that that represents them on a larger a larger scale or a, a larger stage and you want to be a voice for them uh, would you say that uh, that sounds about correct absolutely um Erin, i'm happy that you um uh, emphasized um an organization to represent the colored communities color, let me use plural the colored mm. communities because you just mentioned also that um the colored community is it's not a very a simple uh, term it's not a simple um uh, uh, concept it mm. is it is uh, it's very complex yes but also very exciting so um we do have existing community organizations political parties um who focuses primarily on the colored communities mm. What sets and and let's also just remind your viewers that um, political organizations, community organizations, is nothing new in the mm. colored community. It's always been there. It's always been part of of uh, community life in in the colored communities. Um, but we have seen over many years that representation for colored people or finding that voice, a national voice, if you like, mm. to speak on behalf of or to speak about or to um, put the spotlight on the issues of experience by colored communities. And um, I know that when, we, when one raises the issue of poverty, for instance, there would be some of your viewers who would say, yeah, but poverty exists everywhere in all communities. They are mm. poor white people. Yes. I agree, there are a majority in South Africa, black, poor black South Africans. I mm -hmm. agree, and I, it, it concerns me as much. But every community or population group needs people from within that community or within that group to speak for that group. It does not mean that you have self, you've appointed yourself as the spokesperson for such a group, but it it's better to do what we're doing, which is to put ourselves out there as a community who wants to help, uh, I beg your pardon, an organization who wants to help the, mm. the community as opposed to keeping silent in fear of being accused that you have self-appointed um, your organization as a spokesperson. We want to be a vehicle, a platform, mm. a partner to what is already being done by a whole lot of people and mm. we want to be a bridge between other communities in our case afri forum predominantly represents afrikaners and mm. cape forum wants to represent colored people so the bridge is mm. working together taking mm. the hand of friendship the hand of help that's being reached out have been reached out now exactly a year ago by mm. afri forum Mm. And uh, on that note, Heinrich, you were talking about uh, specifically the, the colored community needing a uh, strong voice to represent them or strong voices rather to represent them today. Yeah. But your focus is also on a provincial focus. You are called the, the Cape Forum, the Corps of Forum. Why does the Cape need a voice? Why does the, the Cape itself need a voice in amongst the provinces, uh, amongst the 60 million people? Why that specific focus on the Cape? What's your role there? So Cape forms part of the names of three provinces, Northern mm. Cape, Eastern Cape, and Western Cape. Mm. But the Western Cape has been home, one, to the colored community or the largest mm -hmm. uh, part of the colored community. That is sort of self-explanatory. And then secondly, the Western Cape is the only province governed by a party other than the ANC. Mm. But it's not just about being governed by another party. It's about setting an example to other provinces, to the rest of the country, of what good governance should look like. I'm not here to speak on behalf of the governing party of the Western Cape, the DA. They mm -hmm. are by far better equipped to do that. But 
even people from other provinces, yes, as much as they may criticize the province or the DA for whatever reason, hmm. cannot deny the fact that when you enter the borders of this province, you do get a sense and see with your own eyes how different it is to other provinces. Hmm. I returned from Johannesburg, Gauteng, last night. Um, this time it was a trip that took me to Centurion, Pretoria area as well as Johannesburg. You have to dot potholes all the time. Even in those areas that would be called uh, middle class or so-called rich areas, you mm. find that situation. Unless people put pressure on their local councillors or their, the council, disrupted and unstable as the Johannesburg mm. one is and the Chwani one was, maybe still is. So there's another point to be made. In the Western Cape, you have, because one party governs effectively, hmm. and yes, because that party has to prove a point, has to hmm. show its supporters and others that it is a better party than the majority party in, in the country. Hmm. One do see a different way of doing things, an effective way. Maintenance in the Western Cape is not a foreign word as it is in other provinces and and also i mean so i often drive around in johannesburg and or, or, or with an um an uber um mm. driver and and what what really what puzzles me is how for instance a traffic light that's been run over i don't know if that's mm -hmm. the, the correct way of putting it by yeah. by by someone would be left there lying on that pavement for weeks and months. Mm. So then I always tell whoever is available to listen. I can only imagine that if the Cape, the Western Cape Premier or his, um, we call them ministers in the, in the province, Minister of Mobility or the Mayor of the City of Cape Town or his member of the mayoral committee responsible for mobility or any of the other leaders in the provincial and the city government who drive past that robot. I can just imagine mm. that they would immediately call whoever is responsible for that area to come and mm. fix that traffic light. Why is it so difficult in other provinces? I don't know. So there is a case to be made that it is important that the Western Cape get more powers to do even more for all the people of the Western Cape, be they black, white, colored, Indian, Chinese, any of the European brothers or African brothers and sisters who has migrated, who's moved to the Cape, um, or as it seems increasingly to be the case, um, people from your province or where you're based now, at least, Adams, um, yeah. Gauteng. Mm. Now I'm. Uh, I am originally from the Cape, and as you know, it's. Uh, I do have a. I do have a love for the province and for the Boerland specifically, where I grew up. So uh, it it isn't the issues that uh, affect the people of the Cape are issues that are close to my heart as well. And on that note, the only way for an organisation to really prove that they represent the people of a, a region or a province is when they tackle the issues that are close to the hearts of those people. You don't have to give me the entire list. I know there's a lot of focus areas that you have, but some examples of key issues that uh, Cape Forum focuses on, just to give the audience an idea. So again, if I have to separate the two pillars, the one, the evolution of power, um, we focus on policing, for instance. Fisheries is a huge sector, problematic as it is, in the, the province. So fisheries is one of, the, um, one of our 10 focus areas. Um, we look at education and in particular mother tongue education, mother tongue yes. education, which is critical. And that's a point that's made all over the world by experts. And yet it seems to be the idea in South Africa, sadly also among some parents, but certainly amongst politicians and politicians in the governing party um, in particular, mm. that to speak English is yeah, I'm speaking English to you, but it's for a for yeah. a for a very good purpose, um, to yeah. promote the organisation. Yeah, but but um, you're not but, being forced. Uh, you're not being forced to to speak oh, absolutely. English. You're using absolutely, the, using yes. as a vehicle. Yeah, 
and and I would like to think that it's my it's the fact that I was educated in my mother tongue Afrikaans that has mm. enabled me to also get a good grip, a grasp, if you like, or good enough at least, um, on, on English. So mother tongue mother tongue education, mother tongue um, is critical. We also look at housing and the rail mm. network to name a few. Sadly, and yeah, sadly, um, Adams, when it comes to all of those uh, different um, functions, governing or government functions, mm. the current governing party is failing or government is failing. Even with all the optimism, all the hope that accompanied the election in December 2017 of President Cyril Ramaphosa as ANC leader, and him taking over the reins from mm. Jacob Zuma in 2018, early in 2018. Um, we, there are still people who have hope, and I'm told that one should always have hope, but um, I think I am I'm past that stage. <laughs> so an organization like Cape Forum has a responsibility to mobilize, yes, for the devolution of powers, but also to form partnerships with other parties, like-minded mm. parties, and um, and also political parties. Now, some people, well, when Cape Forum was, was announced a year ago, some people accused us or branded us or insulted us really as a front organization for a particular party or um, apparently we were um, established to ensure that a particular party stays in power or mm. to um, assist another party in gaining more support. None of that is true, but we do work with both of those parties and yeah. others who are in favor of the devolution of powers. Um, and also when it comes to the devolution of powers, some people choose to confuse whoever is listening to them with independence or with mm -hmm. secession. That's not what Cape Forum stands for. Yes, we are part of the Western Cape Devolution Working Group mm -hmm. in which there are organizations who are very clear about the fact that they want the province to become independent. Mm -hmm. Cape Forum says, let's work together on those issues that we agree on. And I let's get the basics right. Those, yes, I don't have to work walk away from, from those organizations. Ultimately, we mm. want to empower communities with what we call in Afrikaans gemeenskaps federalisme or mm. community federalism. Mm -hmm. um, federalism, as you know, is also has also become a, a swear word again because when you mention federalism, there are those who choose to equate that with independence, with wanting mm. to form an independent state down here, mm. the southernmost tip of Africa. Um, again, that's not what Cape Forum stands for. We want as much power as possible for the province, yes. And we are very mindful that the current constitution does not necessarily allow for all those powers to be devolved, which is why we chose mm. policing as as a first step. It's and a critical just to one, show yeah. A very critical one. And just to show that um, that we are not um, afraid to, to take on the provincial government. The first respondent in, in the court case that we, or the case that we're taking to the constitutional court to force the provincial government and national government um, to to install uh, uh, yeah to install the the legislation that's needed for a province mm. to hold a provincial referendum. So the constitution allows for that, but the the legislation is not yet in place, mm. and so we we have to make the provincial premier the first respondent, the president mm. the second respondent in order mm. for in order to put pressure on the provincial government, for them to put pressure on the national government to give mm. them those powers, um, which as I said is is enshrined in included in the um in the in the um 
constitution, the national constitution. Hmm. Um, so we we do respect the national constitution. We do respect the rule of law. For that's why we we choose this legal route. And thank God that we have a constitutional court, independent judiciary. Um, although a lot of questions are often asked, and may I also add that we, the ideal situation for the Western Cape, uh, as far as we at Cape Forum is concerned, would also be to appoint its own judge president, its own mm. judges, its own mm. police, provincial police commissioner, um, and station commanders, for instance. Because what mm. we see is a national government applying national demographics in a province where the majority population group is not black African, as we call yeah. it. Just to clarify, uh, and, they're applying those demographics in almost in a quota way or in a uh, administrative way that the police force in, in the Western Cape now has to resemble national demographics by government mandate. Yeah, and and and, and coupled with that also, um, where the national police language policy should also be applied in a province that is predominantly Afrikaans speaking. Mm. So Cape Forum is here to fight against those abuses of power, really. Mm. Yeah. And uh, Heinrich, yeah, I think the reason you said uh, some people uh, twist what you're doing or they misconstrue what you're doing and attack you with propaganda, but there's a good reason why they do that, because your organization is striving for something that's very controversial, and that is taking power away from the government, taking power away from a government that's power hungry, that wants all the power centralized in its own hands. Um, and we see how horribly that has worked out. But that's why your organization is it's sometimes painted as controversial because you're swimming against the centralization stream. But it's absolutely the, the fight that needs to be had. I mean, the Western Cape, I think, is the province that can, can tell the best story about how centralism has failed it, uh, how centralizing power in Pretoria has failed, uh, for example, Cape Town. Let's also... Um... And let's give credit where credit is due. Mm. Uh, the Western Cape has been been able to, um, let me use a kind word, um, convince the national government. That is not such a bad idea to allow mm. more independent power producers to make power available. And they've also been able to convince, I should probably say the former Minister of Transport, Fikiri Mbalula, mm -hmm. that it's not such a bad idea to allow the province mm -hmm. and the city to run the rail network, dysfunctional as it is, left in that state by the national government and its um, entities like Prasa. So mm -hmm. the former minister was very keen. Yes, it was important to him to let everyone know that it was actually his idea and that he is <laughs> the one who agreed to the way politicians do. Um, mm. Our only concern is that we need to improve services for people who are now forced to make use of minibus taxis, right. who is a law unto itself. And that's the kind of criminality that sets in when you have a dysfunctional national government. A, I, I wouldn't want to call our country a <laughs> dysfunctional state yet, but there's enough reason to... Yeah, to say to suspect to say that, that the government is dysfunctional fast. in many areas. The government is dysfunctional in many areas, hmm. but South Africa is not a failed state yet. Yeah, yet as some would want us to to believe. Yeah, but uh, the ANC is trying very hard to uh, to send us down that route. Uh, Heinrich, before we continue, I want to read some live comments here from the audience. So firstly, Sideliner Opinion says the rural Afrikaans speaking colored communities will suffer most because of Afrikaans being sidelined at Western uh, Cape universities. Uh, what's, uh, what's your response there before I move on to another comment from the audience? So I mentioned earlier, Aaron, that education and mother tongue education is one of our focus areas, which is mm. why we've been critical of the University of Stellenbosch, who much as they deny it, has reduced Afrikaans to a pavement language. In mm. other words, when you are heard speaking that language on campus, yes, you will get the kind of look that should be reserved for someone who has done something bad. Mm. 
unfortunately, they've been able to um, appoint a commission who initially had to investigate alleged incidents of racism on some of the residences, and it ended up as a commission providing a report to us of just how privileged Afrikaans and, uh, and African speakers apparently still are um, on the campus mm. of the University of Stellenbosch. So university management were then able to use the Kampepe report and present that as proof, scientific proof or legal proof that mm. um, Afrikaans is the reason for a rotten state on some mm. of the um, in some of the uh, residences and and in some of the spaces on on campus. Um, that's I'm happy to add that we also have a human rights commission who has mm. played a pivotal role in making its own finding when it came to another incident where residents at one of the um, um, yeah one of the residences um, um, a female student was told not to speak Afrikaans but English and mm. then the Human Rights Commission made a finding very critical um, against the university mm. the um, rector and vice chancellor Professor Wim de Villiers later said he's already apologized even after the in incident alleged incident happened mm. but um, I was happy that the Human Rights Commission was able to independently make that mm. finding because when you appoint a commission Inevitably, you choose people who you have a good feeling is sympathetic towards you. Um, otherwise, mm. it's not an independent um, commission. Mm. So, yeah, that's what that's what they yeah. got. Um, so, uh, I think a good balancing act um, at the end of the day. Mm. And uh, yeah, that was uh, the the findings by the South African Human Rights Commission in, at Stellenbosch University were actually quite heavy and scathing. It wasn't just a little slap yeah. on the wrist. They called scathing it is the, word. Uh, yes. the, the, the violation of human rights of Afrikaans students at Stellenbosch University. That was their finding. And I'm very glad that uh, someone is standing up for the rights of students at that university. As you mentioned earlier, in a, a province that uh, is majority Afrikaans speaking, I mean, can we agree that that province deserves one university? where students speaking Afrikaans are treated with uh, uh, equally to the other students and not being told that they're not allowed to speak their, their mother tongue in private. It's uh, it's such a basic request, and uh, it seemed that Stellenbosch uh, fumbled that one. Uh, before we continue, uh, just one more comment from the, from the audience. Dagbreker says, there's a homeless guy directing traffic on a major N3 off-ramp in Johannesburg. People give him some money as they pass by. The traffic light, ha light hasn't worked for months. Well, that's what uh, you were describing earlier, Henry. There's some more and, and, evidence. And, I, and I, saw, I saw exactly that yesterday. Mm. Um, a, a homeless guys um, yeah, regulating the, the traffic. So yeah. where are the traffic services at that moment, Ernst? Mm. In... in in the province, in the city, yeah. the city with the and the province with the with the biggest economy in Africa. Mm. We, uh, I mean, call me whatever you want, but yeah. we don't want that in the Western Cape. Yeah, I want to uh, talk a little bit more about language, but maybe this this comment here from the audience will uh, will also add to that. So, sideliner opinion says. They appoint magistrates in the Afrikaans Buelan towns who are Kosa and English speaking, and then the court has to use an interpreter. Again, this is it, it, it's not practical at all, and all it does is it it creates confusion and uh, inefficiency. Uh, maybe just the final thought there from your side on that, Heinrich. The the problems being caused by the government artificially uh, trying to. Uh, uh, sideline and, and uh, marginalize Afrikaans in towns that are almost 90 or 90 percent Afrikaans can you just talk a little bit more about the damage that's being done there so 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 that's that's the problem um Aaron's. um I alluded to it earlier when you have appointments being made from from national um from a national level um yeah. so so that person has no understanding of the local culture or let me yeah, not no call connection. it culture and but a local connection, the, the mm. local way of living, doing things. Mm. Um, 
to 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 just make a, a very simple example something that one finds here in the cape peninsula or on the cape flats um mm. i've been told by people who's done some research another organization that they found in their own research that african policemen in on the cape flats look at every colored boy with the so-called woodies as mm. a potential gangster so i also sometimes wear a woody when i train or when i go to the shop and I can just imagine that I would appear to a policeman who doesn't understand that that could just be popular culture, the, the wearing mm. of, of a particular um, top and not an indication of that person being a potential criminal. Mm. And uh, yeah, to, to add to that point, what's also happening is that you have this uh, uh, language clash where you have to now uh, write down an affidavit or a crime has been committed and you have to, uh, to provide testimony uh, in a language that is not your first language. And I mean, the details in that in a crime in a crime case is very, very important. I mean, you have to you, you can't be fumbling your words and not know what the word for something is. Um, but now you're being forced to do that uh, in English. It's uh, it's very concerning stuff. So uh, I wanted to move on to something else, Heinrich, that I think is also very important. Um, but it's uh, it's less of a of a heavy question, and that is, as someone that grew up in the Cape and that's fighting for for the Cape specifically, what are some of the things that you love about the Cape that you think are worth preserving, and some of the things that you are willing to fight for, things that you identify with the Cape that you think are close to your hearts and that you personally uh, will, will are willing to fight for? I would start with culture, um, Adams, mm. and that culture is not, um, it, it's a very, very, very diverse culture, um, a culture that's been influenced by everyone who, even yes, the colonialists who came to the Cape um, many years ago, um, but that has been influenced by everyone who has since, let's say since the um, 1700s, or no, well, 1600s, um, made um, the Cape a home. That culture has been influenced by by all those people. And, and, and that's what makes Cape culture so unique, so enjoyable by whoever, um, Take makes time to to, mm. to to enjoy and experience it, um, and then obviously um, coupled with the with the culture, there's just so much to see. If you are a lover of sightseeing, whether it's old buildings, whether it's the winelands, whether it's the oceans, whether it's the ostriches in Oatsworn, or whether it's the um, wildlife that you find in in many areas very close to the city even um city of cape town um and 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 yes um there is so much to celebrate um also also the fact that i mean the afrikaans that we speak here is is also a mixed version of all the different influences um mm. into that language um much as a uh, as I said earlier, a lot of people um, pretend or is trying to to be English. Um, okay, mm. that's fine. There's room for them too. Um, but but your tourist uh, certainly wants to experience the realness and not and not anything fake, anything that is um, that is made up to try and impress mm. them. Um, so so yes, there's the culture I mentioned. Good governance. You can't take that away. A tourist wouldn't be able to come here if the crime was in, on such a level where you can't really leave the airport. Um, mm. so, so Cape Town, yes, enjoys good support from, from people traveling from Africa and the rest of Africa and Europe um, and the Americas every year when it's, when it's um, mm. a tourist season. Um, and, and so one wouldn't want that to... to, to um, to, be, to get lost but but it mm. also doesn't mean that one is not aware and concerned about the levels of poverty and inequality and joblessness that one finds in the same beautiful cape um mm. but the one doesn't have to exclude the other we have to do more for poor people yes but we are allowed to also at the same time enjoy the beauty and and often the proponents of um or those who who speak um, on behalf of the poor um, 
almost don't want anything good to happen in the more well-off areas. And I think mm. that's a it's, it's, it's a lazy argument. It's, um, yeah, well, there is space for all of this, the beauty and the challenges, and we need to do more to uh, to deal with the challenges. Hmm. Heinrich, as we uh, as we approach the end here, I wanted to ask you about, uh, uh, you were talking about the beauty and the, there's a documentary that uh, Cape Forum recently made that shows some of the beautiful scenery there in the Cape, specifically on the coast. Um, uh, the the documentary is called Tissany Devil and in Deep Blue Sea, but it has English uh, subtitles. Can you quickly uh, almost give us a little trailer on uh, what that documentary is about? Someone asks you, I heard you made a documentary. What's it about, Heinrich? Yeah. So there's a so there's a there's a classic example, um, Adams, of how the beauty and the challenges collides. Mm. Um, we have all the beautiful coastal towns um, on the west coast, the south coast, and further. But at the same time, what you in those towns are subsistence fishers who has been disappointed by the government through the mess up with the allocation of fishing rights. People who have been fishing for generations and mm -hmm. who are now left destitute, dependent on social grants to survive. So the documentary allows those people, some of them, to tell their story in their own words. And I want to encourage people to go on YouTube and watch mm. the documentary. Um, as you said, there are English subtitles for those who don't understand Afrikaans. Mm, perfect. And um, I know it's a, it seems to be a difficult question, but I, I think it is a critical one from the audience. I'll, I think I'll make it the last question. Um, Sideliner Opinions asks, how can we curb gangsterism which plagues some uh, commu colored communities and which is spreading to rural communities? I mean, you don't have to give us the ultimate solution here now, but what are some of the things that Cape Forum thinks can be done uh, to fight uh, this form of crime that plagues the Cape? I am relying here on what the experts say. Mm. The experts tell us that gangsterism has become an economy on its own. So in order for one to deal with it, one has to create other economic opportunities on the one hand for those who are getting involved in gangsterism as a means of survival. On the other hand, yes, it is a crime problem. Now, when dealing with crime, the police and the other law enforcement agencies um, have their own plans and strategies. Doesn't seem to be very successful, mm -hmm. but at least there's something being done on that side. It will never solve the problem for as long as it is those gangsters gang leaders are, are enabling communities poor people in those communities to be able to eat because one of the sons of that family is involved or because a mother is willing to hide um whether it's guns or drugs in her house in exchange for money to pay for her rent or for, to pay for her the kids at school um, money, mm. or simply to put food on the table. Mm. All right. Heinrich, final question is not really a, uh, it's more of a positive one, just what the future holds. What uh, What is on the horizon for Cape Forum? Something, you don't, uh, don't have to give us uh, your entire plan. Some things are still, uh, I think, uh, in the works. But what are some of the yeah. things that people can expect in the future from your organization? So let me first take a step back, um, Aaron, if you don't mind. Mm. Um, yeah, sure. We, when, when we were launched on the 4th of May, 2022, and even before that, for about a month before that, in the, in the run-up to our official launch, we dealt, we were criticized from left, right, and center. Mm. Colored black Africans, the English Africans, the whole the, the whole caboodle. I don't know if that's in English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, one year later, we're still standing. And mm. one year later, increasingly, I find that people, what, what we refer to as normal people, mm. um, would come up to me and say, well done, continue with this work. There's a need mm. for an organization like Cape Forum. Don't mm. be distracted. Don't be this um, sidetracked by by those who criticize you. Um, mm. So the first year was used 
to to make people aware of the existence of our organization and what we want to achieve. Hmm. And the first year was also used to build networks. So there are a whole lot of communities who reach out to us and community leaders and people who are already doing good work that's in line with what we want to achieve. We've been mm-hmm. partnering with them in the Cape Peninsula, yes, and also rural areas. And so what we need to do now is to find the funding that will enable us to take projects to a different level. And that mm-hmm. will be the focus for the year or two to come. Um, and coupled with that, obviously, also to get people to to join the organization. And as I said, we're not a political party, so it's not like we're asking for votes. It's simply for us to have Mm. the data, to have the support in order for us to use those people in those communities where they are living um, to do some of the work that needs to be done instead of Cape Forum sort of coming as a big brother to those communities and and present ourselves as a messiah. We we are not Mm. that. We're not pretending to be that. We are here to help. We are a servant much rather. Hmm. Heinrich Dagbreker in the audience says uh, that uh, the, 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 the fact that you were getting criticism, uh, Dagbreker says that me and Heinrich is very taken, voorspoed. No, excellent. Thank you very much, Dagbreker. Heinrich, uh, last thing, how can you talked about people supporting you? How can people support Cape Forum? There is a link to your uh, website. You don't have to give that in the description. Oh, f- fantastic, because I was... Yeah. <laughs> thank you. So I was going to say, Edens, um, um, I'm assuming people who are watching the interview are people mm. who have access to internet data right. to go online. So I want to encourage them to to visit our website, um, mm-hmm. to make contact with us, um, and also just to, to, to let us know about the needs in communities, about those areas where they think we should get involved. Um, like the one viewer who mentioned the appointment of police um, in mm. rural areas, for instance. So th- that is why we are here. Let us know mm. so that we can take steps where steps need to be taken. Mm. Excellent. Uh, Heinrich, thank you very much for joining me here tonight. Uh, it was an insightful uh, interview. I think this is exactly what I wanted to, uh, the type of information I wanted to get to people. What are you about? What do you want to, uh, what do you want to achieve? Who do you represent? And uh, what are your dreams? And uh, Sideline Opinion says in the audience, you have a massive, massive task at Coop Sephora Meindrich to be a voice for moderate conservative colored people. I wish you the best of luck and Godspeed for the uh, important venture. Well, excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you very, uh, very much. Thank you also mm. to you, Adams, for allowing me the opportunity to speak to your audience. Mm. Excellent. And as I said, there is a link in the description to the website. Go check it out. Go read what they're about. There's a lot of uh, uh, interesting stuff to go look at. And uh, thank you very much for everyone that tuned in. Thank you for uh, everyone for your questions and comments uh, live. And uh, yeah, uh, I'll check you again next week. Uh, If you like the show, you can leave a like. Uh, You can also subscribe. And if you uh, want to stay part of the conversation uh, and it's not live anymore, you can still take part by taking part in the comment section below the video. Heinrich, lekker week for you. Lekker aunt in lekker navig. Amal blij veilig. Tot ziens. Cheers, guys. Have a good one and God bless. Okay.